Good morning, Park Cities. How you all doing? Wonderful, fantastic. Are you ready for the Word of God? I am ready. It's such an honor to be here, and thank you for coming today. The joy of every pastor after a whole week of meditating in God's Word is to, to come and to share God's Word with you all. So we learn together, so we walk together. Thank you for being here, and for those who are tuning in online, thank you for being part of our family. I thank you, the leadership of Pastor Jeff, who allows me to occasionally to come and, and preach with the whole crowd today. I'm going to start with a personal testimony or experience. I grew up in Colombia, by the way, by those of you who don't know me. And every day I would get up around 5 a.m. in the morning, take a shower, and then have breakfast, a good breakfast with coffee. Coffee is always good in Colombia. <laughs> and then I would go out to take the public transportation we have to pay to, to go to school. There were many students in my neighborhood who would take the transportation, so we would have to be there early because buses will be like packed. I mean, packed. People are standing. So you wanted to get there early. Sits before, and there was this time that I took the bus. There were two routes that I could take. The first one was route number one, that would take me from literally from the front of my house to the front of the school. And then the second route I could take was route number 10, that would take me from the corner of my house to about three blocks from school. So I would take either one. One day I was there and I took the bus, I was happy, I uh, took my book with me because it would take me about 30 minutes to get to school, so I would select a book to read. I have always loved to read, always. So I dive myself into the book, some sort of literature, and 25 minutes after I looked through the windows and everything looked unfamiliar. I was 10 years old. My sister had to stay home because she was ill, and that was probably precisely what happened, <laughs> that she was always on top of things. But then I got anxious, afraid. I went to talk to the uh, bus driver, and he told me, uh, you took the wrong bus. We had a new route, and it started today, and you are in the opposite side of the city. I felt terrified, terrified. Today we laugh, but I felt terrified. So I got off the bus immediately. I took another one to the center of the city. Then I took another one that would drop me off about 10 blocks from the school. I walk and arrive about, I arrive about an hour and 30 minutes after. I was afraid of two things, my dad and my teachers. And I learned two lessons. First one, always double check the route before you get in the bus. Second one, don't wait 25 minutes to find out that you took the wrong bus. Perhaps that happens in our spiritual life. Perhaps you planned out your life and you, you took the wrong bus. And you landed to a wrong destination. And you thought that you were there in the, in the right way, but you find yourself that you made the wrong choice, wrong decision, perhaps a relationship, job, I don't know. Today, we find ourselves in, in our dwell readings as a church family. We are reading the Gospel of John. How many of you are reading the Gospel of John? Raise your hand. Amen. Of those of you who, have, who haven't started, may God forgive you. <laughs> but He is a Redeemer God. You can join us anytime. But in that reading, we've been finding and highlighting some I am statements of Jesus. We have already heard that he said, I am the light of the world. He said, I am the good shepherd. He said, I am the gate. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And in today's reading, we are going to find one of the famous ones. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And to do that, we're going to examine the scriptures in the 14th chapter of John, verses 1 to 10. It's going to be there on the screen. 
I'm going to read it from God's word. This is what the word of God says. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Haven't I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen? To understand what precipitated these words, we have to go back to chapter 13 to understand the context. And Jesus and his disciples have just finished observing the Passover. They had a great meal, a pleasant meal. And Jesus has already washed all their stinky feet. But he had also mentioned to them the horrific news that their leader Peter will deny him. And also that one of their own will soon betray him. And on top of that, Jesus told them, I am going to be going away. I'm going to die. Boom. Their hearts were troubled. Troubled. And the word troubled that we find in this text, it's the same word that Jesus used when he was in front of Lazarus' tomb. He was bothered by. He was troubled. So we find ourselves that the words in chapter 14 are supposed to bring comfort to the very scary, angry, and confused disciples. And today we can learn some lessons, lessons from Jesus. Jesus offers hope, grace, and himself to address our fears. I don't know how many of you have any sort of fear today, but today this message is for you and for me. So first one, Jesus offers hope. Verses 1 to 3, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So Jesus starts speaking to Peter alone, and then he starts to address the whole crowd, in this case, the disciples. And he tells them to believe in him. In contrast to the warning words to Peter, these are words of comfort and strength for their future grief. The word belief is an altering word. It means to think to be true, to be persuaded of, and to have confidence in. Literally, the word means to exercise faith in someone or something. So Jesus explained how the disciples could calm their troubled hearts. And the verb believe, pisteo in Greek, occurs twice. And in this context, I think it is an imperative, but also an indicative. God, Jesus, is telling them, stop worrying, stop being troubled, and start believing in me as you trust in God. So it is in this context that Jesus says, trust God and trust me, there is no need to be troubled or fearful. The message is applicable to us today. There is a faith to embrace here. And without faith, it is impossible to please 
to please? Come on, help me out. And then Jesus is saying, in my father's house, there are many dwellings, he continues to say. So this doesn't mean the temple in Jerusalem, nor the heavenly temple, but heaven itself. It is a household in keeping with the language of the whole passage and the gospel. It is a household. And the Latin Vulgate translated the noun mansiones to mansions in the King James Version. And you know the King James Version. I can't even pronounce the King James Version. But it says, you know, that the Lord is preparing a mansion. So we have this connotation that there is a lavishness in heaven that the Lord is building this room, this mansion for us. I have preached so many times this passage during funeral services, and I have said something like this. Imagine if your house here on earth is beautiful. Oh, imagine the house that Jesus is building for you in heaven, and in everybody says, Amen. Precisely, it's not that. When I dive into the context, I find that Jesus is talking about the wedding picture. And in the Oriental tradition, in those days and times, the groom would go for about a year to build a house, an apartment, or a room, depending on the money, <laughs> in the father's house. And then about a year after, he would come back to have the wedding ceremony and to have the party and take his wife to his father's house. So what Jesus is saying, the focus is not on the mansion and the mansion that Jesus is building for us. I'm pretty sure it is beautiful, but the focus is that he is returning for us, that he is returning for his church, for his bride. So the focus is not on the lavishness of the heaven, but on the person that is coming back for us. And that person is the groom, Jesus Christ, and he's coming back for you and me at any point, at any point in life any moment in life. You know what? <laughs> that happens to us. He's coming to us, for us. This is the only instance in the entire New Testament where Jesus speaks of coming back or coming again with his own words. You see this in John chapter 14, and then when you couple this with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you see that we have the theology of the rapture. If you believe in the rapture or not, that's your point. The point is that Jesus is coming back for us. Amen? Now you can say amen. Now he's coming back. And this is consistent with the future coming of the Son of Man in the other three Gospels, where Jesus promises that the Son of Man will send his angels and will gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the sky. And this is the hope that we have in Jesus. We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is a future to envision in Jesus. And it includes a precious place. It includes a prepared place. And it includes a powerful promise. Every day you and I live with one of the greatest promises the world has ever known as our support. We have our Savior's promise that he will personally will come for us. We are not home yet. Amen? We have hope in the future destination. Heaven is a prepared place made by Jesus just for his bride, the church. Oh yes, heaven is a populated place since it is not only the habitation of God, but the place where those saved by the grace of God will be spending eternity with him. It is also a perpetual place since the glories of that place will abide unchanged throughout the endless generations and ages. It is a perfect place because perfection will be experienced there finally. A little girl was walking with her dad on an evening and she looked up to heaven and she said, Oh dad, imagine if heaven is so beautiful on this side. I'm just wondering how heaven would be looking like on the other side. She was right. She was right. 
It will be a perfect place, no disturbances allowed in heaven. Oof. There will be perfect joy, tears will be banished forever. Oof. There will be perfect service, nothing will hinder or work for him. Oof. There will be perfect people, redeemed and righteous people, not righteous by their own efforts, but made righteous by his free grace. Perfection, if you think you're perfect, you're not. In heaven you will be, okay? There will be a heavenly family reunion in heaven. All those who have trusted in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be in heaven. Oh, we will enjoy heavenly blessings. And we are going to see Jesus as well. All our feeble efforts to describe heaven fall short of what that place might look like. But the best reason to be hopeful for heaven is that we know that our master will be there and that should be enough. That one day I shall at last, as we sang today, be upon the face of the one who died for my sins on Calvary. And when I shall at last have the opportunity to bow at his feet and shall praise to him. This is a rehearsal here. A amazing choir that we have here. Oh, I loved it. I grew up in a Presbyterian and Baptist church. So, uh, I mean, it takes me back to like my youth. You know, there is a, a hymn entitled What a Day Will Be by Jim Hill. And this is what it says. The, there is a coming day when no heartaches shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus shall I see and I look upon his face to the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. There will be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no more pain, no more parting over there. And forever I will be with the one who died for me. What a day, glorious day that will be. Oof, I'm ready to go to heaven, but I have so much work here. Not only Jesus offers hope but in this passage, but he also offers his grace. Look, it gets better. Verse 4, and you know the way to where I'm going. And Thomas, <laughs> Thomas said to him, Lord, uh, not really. We, we don't know the way that you're going. How, how can we know the way? And then in verse 8, you know, another disciple says, Philip, Lord, show us the Father and it will be enough for us. We see in verses 5 and 8, two disciples pushed back on Jesus, and Jesus extended his grace. They challenged him and asked questions. However, Jesus is there to receive our questions and their questions at that moment when we are confused. Because when you're grieving, you're confused. You don't think right. You don't act right. But Jesus is there. He doesn't condemn them. I mean, he just tells them, I'm here. He listens to them. So apparently the father's house did not clearly identify heaven to them. So they ask the question. And Philip exemplifies you and I. I mean, Philip was ready to give his life for Jesus in about two chapters before this episode. But now he's struggling with their unbelief. Their unbelief is unbelievable. <laughs> But when we are confused, Jesus welcomes our questions. He doesn't reject our questions when we are afraid. On the contrary, he listens to our questions. And, and he asks Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. They have been with Jesus. They have seen the miracles of Jesus, the signs and wonders of Jesus. And now he's doubtful and he says, Jesus, where is the way? And sometimes we don't know the way. And Philip also says to him, well, not only that, Jesus, but show us the Father. <laughs> so what Philip is saying is that, Jesus, we believe in you, but we want to see God. I mean, we want the manifestation, the theophany 
The theology of theophany got appearing in our eyes so we can truly corroborate that he is God. So we trust in you, Jesus, but we want something else. Because when we are afraid and when we are confused and when we are in grief, we need something else other than Jesus. We want to see it with our own eyes. And Jesus is there. When you are scared, you feel that you need something else. And the disciples knew that they had Jesus, but they needed someone else. But Jesus acknowledges our fears, and he's there for us when we are afraid. Our doubts, our pain, our agony do not let us hear what God has been telling us, but he remains faithful to all his promises. So therefore, Jesus not only offers hope, offers grace, but he offers himself. Ooh, it gets better. Point number three. Right there. Good Baptist. Three points. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you have already known my Father. Wow. And Philip already asked this question. Show us the Father. And Jesus says to him, I've been with you, Philip. You know me. Whoever has seen the Father has seen me as well, and vice versa. And verse 10 says, Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. So Jesus, again, gave an enigmatic answer. He had already plainly said at least four times in this gospel that he is. He is the Messiah. But the disciples' preconceptions about the Messiah and his ministry don't allow them to see that the Messiah is right there. And he says, Ego I me, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the words way, truth, and life are all synchronized in this answer. Jesus described himself as the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth from God and the life from God. Let me repeat it again. Jesus is the way to God because he is the truth from God and the life from God. He is the way because he is the only one who gave his life for us. He is the truth because he embodies the God's supreme revelation, becoming, becoming a man and suffering for our sins in the cross of Calvary. He is the life because he is life and he imparts life. We cannot understand him as the way unless we understand what he means by truth and life. Jesus is talking about soy life. We've been talking about this. Is this complete, holistic, eternal life. In Greek, there are a couple of words to talk about life. The first one is bio, where we get the biology. Second one is psyche. Talks about your soul, your emotions, your heart. And this one, soy, that means eternal life. In the Gospel of John, you see the sick life and the soy life. You see that he gives himself, his soul, and everything that he is so that we could have the soy life, the eternal, everlasting, flourishing life. And Jesus is talking, I am the soy life. He is the way because he's the only one who gave his life for us. Jesus not only shows people the way, but he is the way. He designed the way. He is with us during the way. And he will be with us at the end of the way. The Christian life, it is a journey, but it's also a destination. You know, if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything because the truth is absolute. Jesus is the truth. That truth is Jesus. Do you know that truth? Are you set free? John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And the truth is Jesus. You know, the truth means that he's faithful and he is reliable. Repeat after me. Faithful and reliable. You're not falling asleep. Okay, I will just check it. He is completely faithful. We can confidently sing, Great is that faithfulness. 
He cannot be changed. He cannot be moved. He is sovereign. He is in control. He is all powerful, all knowledgeable. He is eternal. He is the beginning and He is the end. So what can you do to a person that is no longer afraid of dying? The answer is nothing. Because we have the soy life. This is the heart of it all. Jesus was summarizing and connecting many revelations about himself that he had previously shared with his disciples. He died to set us free from fear, from death, from agony, from loss, from suffering, by becoming those things for us. God the Father sent him as a ransom for many. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus was not saying that he was one way to God among many. He was not saying that he pointed the way to God only. He said that he was the way. And this still is an exclusive claim to be the only way to heaven. There is a mistaken idea today that you can come to him your way. Oh yes, you can come to Jesus your way. Well, not really. There is just one way, and it's Jesus Christ. Amen? On Thursday, I was preparing the sermon notes, and I always go on live on radio, the old-fashioned way of, you know, listening to prayer requests and praying for people. <laughs> so I was doubtful about the, the radio program. I needed to submit notes in English and then in Spanish, three sermons today. So I was like, okay, do I call and cancel? <laughs> But no, I said, no, this is the evangelistic message. So I was, I was receiving those phone calls, and the last phone call, three minutes, right before we ended the program, I had this young guy saying, Pastor Orlando, I grew up in church. I have taken the wrong way, and now I confess publicly that I want to repent of my sins, and I know that Jesus could continue to be my Lord and my Savior, and I want to turn from my sins and I want to be committed to the Lord. And I want to tell everybody here, one minute to finish the sermon, <laughs> the message right there. And then he's saying, oh, I want to tell the world that my life has been changed right now because the gospel is still alive. And I want to commit my life to Jesus. Jesus is the way. Amen. On Friday, we had a couple's conference for the Spanish service. And, and we had originally planned to host them in the loft. And we had a good turnout, and we have to move them to the Great Hall. And we had about 100 couples coming here. I don't know where they came from, but they came to our church. And, and a lot of couples came, and they recommitted their, their selves not only to themselves, but to the Lord. And that's what I'm a pastor. Because I believe that the way of Jesus is the way of living a plentiful life. That's the soy life that he gives us today. The disciples don't know what's going on. But Jesus knows our fears. The disciples obviously regarded Jesus very highly, but they were doubtful that he was the only way. I don't know what's going on in your life, but the, the word that became alive more than 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, is still life in our life. He brings life to our life. I don't know your pain. I don't know your agony. I don't know what's going on with you. You probably grew up in church like me. I, I, I fall asleep in the pew going, growing at church. I started preaching when I was 14. I did so many things. But let me tell you that every time I am finding myself in this scripture that he is the only way, he is the only truth, and he is the only life, it still moves my heart. Your life could be changed today. What is God saying to you today? I give you hope. Do not be afraid. I give you hope. Do not be afraid. Second, I give you my life. You could have a new life today. Perhaps you are here, you're tuning in online, and you're listening to this sermon, and God is telling you, I can give you a new life. Third, I give you purpose. You could have direction in this life. I don't know where you're going. I'm hoping that you are going in the way of Jesus. 
But he tells us today, I can give you direction. Fourth, I give you a future. You could have so a life. I am glad that when we do not understand what's going on in our lives, what's going to happen to us, we have so many things to worry about. We have a lot of drama everywhere, right, in the world, and sometimes at home. I have two teenagers at home. I have drama all the time. And we need Jesus. I have purpose. But Jesus is also telling us, I give you future, the soy life. I am glad that he has given us everything that we need today. So he can take away all of our fears. And as I did when I was a young gentleman, I turned like 40-something in February 1st. I know I look younger by the grace of God. <laughs> and I had a fear. Let me share you this. My mom died when, I was, when she was my age right now. And I have lived my life in a fast pace. Because we all have fears. We all do. But when I find myself in the scriptures, I, I always, I'm always moved by the fact that Jesus is our life. And he can take away your fears. It doesn't matter how many years you have in the scriptures, how many degrees you have. I have some degrees, and I'm getting my second PhD here. So it's not about degrees. It's about the transforming presence, the living word of the soil life that Jesus offers to us. And perhaps you took the wrong boss in life. Perhaps you don't know your way. Find your way in Jesus. Stay in the way with Jesus. Walk in the way with Jesus. And endure until the end with Jesus. Is he your truth and your life? Maybe. But is he your way of your half? your way. I'm going to make two invitations today. The first one is everybody could bow their heads and, and pray this prayer of salvation. Maybe you're here for the first time or, I don't know, for the hundredth time, but this message makes sense to you. And today is, is the day of salvation and the Lord Jesus comes and he talks to your heart and he says, I am here. I am the way. Perhaps you want to come to Jesus and you want to repent of your sins. You can repeat this prayer with all your heart, believing in him. You can say, Jesus Christ, I repent of all my sins. I am sorry for my sins. Today, I received the gift of salvation. I receive Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. Today, I want to follow you in obedience. I want to be your fo follower and your child. I do this by faith in the name of Jesus. Amen.